अच्छे ना जयराम मैन इस इज एन एनवायरमेंट इंजीनियर वर्किंग नाउ विद अ डेवलपमेंट पार्टनर एजेंसी कॉल्ड के एफ डब्ल्यू बैंक इट्स वन ऑफ दिगेस्ट सच एजेंसीज इन दर्ल्ड एंड शी ऑल्सो हैज अ यू एन यू कनेक्ट फॉर द यू एन यू ऑडियंस दो इट इज यू एन यू टोक्यो एंड वुड लाइक टू शेयर I feel Archana has a lot on her plate because uh, she's been involved in working with governments in design uh, and implementation of urban infrastructure including uh, uh, focusing on climate resilience and urban flooding related uh, issues and while doing all this also drawing inferences uh, for uh, informing you know the policy uh, debates and discourses with the government I uh, would now invite Uh, Archana to share her views on her own story of what she is doing because presently she is based in a in a coastal uh, state and in a coastal city of of uh, Chennai in Tamil Nadu, which is very big. Uh, Archana, based on your ongoing work, uh, please share your thoughts on uh, maybe these areas. Why is there a flooding challenge in the area you are working in 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 Chennai and in Tamil Nadu? and uh, what exactly is kfw itself uh, doing mm. in this regard what are your projects and what is their implementation process broadly and uh, we understand there are many issues relating to data as policy analysts and uh, external people we wonder about data and data consistency so when you are actually uh, designing and uh, implementing these projects what are the kinds of data and measures of resilience that you were using to evaluate your impact and for further improvements uh, uh, each with each round of uh, interventions and finally uh, what are the plans for transferability of the ownership and maintenance of the assets and infrastructures created uh, by the support of uh, your uh, projects and programs and uh, what measures should be uh, taken into consideration for ensuring their uh, long lastingness and to ensure robustness over to you please over to archana good morning good evening good afternoon to everybody joining us thank you so much for having me today uh it's my pleasure to be here and talk to you about a um, project which basically uh, i began my or yeah began my career with and i'm still pursuing so <laughs> when we're talking about uh, issues like flood resilience we know that um, implementation of measures just takes a long time and and um has a, a variety of complications and interventions which are involved in in it in of its own so um today's the perspective i wanted to bring uh, to everybody today is um to of course give you a background of of uh, the city and and the problems that we are facing but also going beyond that so what does it take at the end of the day to um design something have a concept in mind uh make sure that it fits the situation uh the the city that you're in and ensure that all the other steps are followed so that at the end of the day you can execute a project and it's uh believe me a long long process which involves a lot of different steps as as um i would uh, talk to you more about um just as a very quick background for uh, those who may not be aware I come uh, I work for an organization called KFW Development Bank it's a German state owned bank and uh, why it's important here is that um, all the official development assistance which is coming from the government of Germany into India um for financial cooperation is being um, channeled through KFW so that would mean that India can access financing um in terms of uh, loans which are of i mean infrastructure loans typically which are longer tenured so 15 years 20 year loans and these loans are interest subsidized by the german government which means that you could tap into um say a major amount of capital for uh, relatively lesser prices as you would uh, if you compare it to you know market rates so that is the uh, advantage and uh, if you see we have a india is one of the biggest partners for germany in this regard currently we have about Uh, 1 billion euros being committed annually 
which is a huge, huge amount. And um, almost all of it comes in terms of interest subsidized loans to the country. And uh, I work for the Sustainable Urban Development Vertical, whereas we also have other sectors like energy and natural resources management, where we are quite active in India. Okay, so coming to project implementation, I, like I said in the beginning, um, the problem that the case that I'm going to focus on is the coastal city of Chennai, where I'm currently uh, at as well. Um, the issues are uh, of, of the two faced. So like I think uh, Mr. Tahir was also mentioning, it is not usually a very clear cut cookie cutter case of, yes, this is urban flooding. This is what is causing it. And these are the interventions that you could uh, take to mitigate this problem. Um, as you would see, if I could just go to the next slide, um, the issue in Chennai was twofold. So the whole um, process began because of the 2015 catastrophic floods, uh, which occurred um, wherein I think we received about 1,000 millimeters, more than 1,000 millimeters of rainfall concentrated over a very, very short period of around two to three days with I think more than 490 mm coming in on a single day. And um, this was caused mainly due to a natural phenomena, but was of course exacerbated by uh, man-made uh, issues when it came to city planning and uh, rampant urbanization. Chennai, if you see down here in the south, is is a, is a coastal city, um, and it's known to have a very very intricate hydrological network, uh, which is maintains a very delicate balance in between um, the different areas upstream where the catchments are, and of course the water flows into the sea. Uh, there are three main basins in the city. And um, all of them are very, very, like I said, um, intricately linked to form this beautiful hydrology. And uh, traditionally, also in the city, we've had a system of tanks, uh, which are your know, retention structures um, in the upstream areas, but also temple tanks, which are attached to these really old ancient temples, uh, which acted as sort of water storage structures before the water was let out into the sea. So if you see historically, the city has been really well planned hydrologically um, in order to incorporate, um, um, let's say, excess runoff going into the sea and also conserving water in situ, which was very, very important. And uh, we also have in the basin that I have the privilege to work in a Ramsar site. So it's, it's a huge wetland and uh, it sees a lot of migratory birds. And it's also acts as a very, very important buffer for the city uh, in terms of even tidal effects and, and coastal um, uh, rainfall events in terms of um, heavy, heavy rainfall events, let's say. But um, it's one of the biggest metropolitan uh, cities in, in the country and has seen rampant urbanization, often unplanned. So um, we have seen a lot of these areas being encroached upon and also uh, being let out for commercial development. And that was basically what caused the whole um, issue of the 2015 floods. Um, and of course, there was, um, since I said the cause was linked to global warming and climate change, in contrast, in 2019, a few years later, the city faced day zero. So here we had a situation where there was flooding and droughts happening at the same time, which was, and both of them were extreme events. So, and we were at the time also designing this program as a response to uh, the flood that happened. So um, the things that we had to take into consideration was um, a comprehensive understanding of the hydrology of the area. Like I said, the traditional hydrological structures have all but been destroyed because of, of urbanization. So we did sort of a one of its kind hydrological mapping of the basin that we're working in. So I work in the southern part of Chennai and um, then tried to come up with measures of whatever is the bare minimum grain infrastructure requirement in terms of additional drains that we are needed, but focusing more on conserving water in situ. And that involved a lot of the use of existing wetland sites, a lot of um, deepening of retention tanks, a lot of building interlinkages between different retention structures, and also incorporating concepts of, say, sponge cities and NBS. So that is something, uh, it was sort of a holistic package of solutions that we looked at. And this was the concept which we had generated after a year of, of uh, going to the field and studying. 
um and it was all beautiful on paper but like i said then it comes then comes uh, the issue of project implementation now if you see uh, as a financing agency we work um we straddle both worlds in the sense in the in terms of we really want the project to succeed we want to see interventions of the ground that really work at the end of the day and at the same time we have to manage political priorities and bureaucracy so a successful project implementation depends a lot on how you do both of these things well and that is why i have mentioned points like political agenda priorities policies budget and fiscal spaces to be sort of the main um uh parameters that we deal with when we come up with design of projects um so usually you will find that responses to natural disasters and the proactiveness with which the government machinery comes up with uh, say schemes or or measures often don't uh, you know match or often have a mismatch so ideally if you have say if you've identified a problem you would assume that you would allocate resources or some budget heads to deal with these issues right away because that is in your memory it's a priority and then you can act fast on it but usually that doesn't happen because when a disaster like this occurred it took a year for for the government to come up with this kind of uh, a solution a measure and then have that allocated in their budget and then it be made a priority and then you know having um, partners like us coming in and kicking in discussions to so by the time we started even started with the project concept it was one one and a half years later so what that lag does is it's like out of sight out of mind so then takes out the urgency of the whole situation but even then you have to make sure that you kind of keep revisiting it and um keep coming up with solutions that are relevant and not just convenient for the time being right so having said that uh, when it you know sort of distill down to project level these are the different steps that uh, like i said um, are important in the whole project cycle so once you have a concept you really need to see how feasible it is on the ground and that is why you have something known as feasibility studies where you actually study uh, the measures proposed uh find out exact locations in the basin say uh, even if you if you're suggesting an nbs measure you would want to see if it if it makes sense in a particular area which are the areas that you would like to consider what should be the kind of nbs solution so a lot of these things come under the feasibility uh, i mean a step and once all of that is finalized you would come up with a total package of financing so you say this is the total cost attached to it this is the financing structure and this is how we go on and then as a bank then i come in and say okay this this is the proportion of funds i bring in you bring in and there is a whole set of rules and is a universe that is attached to it um, some of you may be knowing but just for the benefit of others and then comes i would say according to me one the most important steps in realization of a project and that is your procurement policies what are your legal policies what are your environmental and social um, um let's say parameters that you're looking at the project from and of course incorporating uh, ironically climate aspects in a climate project because sometimes um infrastructure measures uh, which are designed by external consultants and engineering firms tend to be very infrastructure heavy so you might end up actually jeopardizing the whole um uh ecosystem just by you know focusing on green infrastructure solutions and then what kind of contracts are you drawing up what is your um mechanism of disbursement are you getting the right consultants on board um does the consultant have enough ground experience to really execute the project or do they have enough let's say um experience to maneuver government systems because and this is also a direct response to one of the questions the main stakeholder in these processes is usually a uh, public sector entity and a lot of these requirements are then uh, external when it comes from an external financing agency and it takes a lot for a government machinery to cope with all these reporting requirements so then you would really need somebody to handhold them and and really you know show them the way through for uh, effective implementation of the project and what are the tendering structures like and all of that and then is basically physical implementation so 
uh, as I was saying in the beginning, from 2015-2016 to when the loan was effective in 2019, we have come to a stage of implementation in 2022. So you see the lag which has kind of cropped up because there are all these things that really go into preparation of a very uh, robust project. And within this, all of this, you have to make sure that, you know, <laughs> the priorities and, and the whole idea of, of having an inclusive project is not lost uh, on anybody. And then finally, I think, and the most important thing is, of course, operations and maintenance of the assets. And I'll come to that um, uh, as a question, um, because it was also a question. Uh, in this case, we have, since it's a public sector project, we have the city corporation, which is one of, it, I mean, it is the largest city corporation in the whole of the state of Tamil Nadu. They will be the owners of the assets at the end of the day. Um, they are also responsible for creating the asset, which is a win-win, I think, in this case, at least because it's the same agency creating and owning the asset. So uh, in this case, we have incorporated something called as... Um, accompanying grants which come along with our loans and these grants are essentially supposed to safeguard your investment uh, in the sense um, building provisions for ONM and a lot of this is if you see uh, for the grain infrastructure that you build it might mean um, ensuring that there is no manual desilting of, of uh, these stormwater drains because that happens quite a lot. And then um, we have also incorporated provisions for them to access, you know, state of the art machinery. So there's like advanced robotics that help you to clean the smallest of tanks. So if you do that periodically before the monsoons, it helps you, you know, retain the water inside these retention structures, etc. Uh, with this, I'll just come to the final slide. And I don't want to so these are basically the learnings that uh, have come out of this process for me personally. And um, I would say that these are also opportunities where you can actually implement projects uh, as and how you, you envisage them and how you design them. Because there will be um, pushes and pulls from different directions. Uh, priorities will change. Um, but then if you keep these things uh, at the core of your, um, let's say, implementation agenda, uh, you are more or less assured to have a project that implements itself in time and also meets the objectives of having sort of a holistic uh, approach to uh, tackling urban floods. Thank you Thank so much.